is high on the list of icons sold during a rally, those stock photo shots of traders face palming during a crash, all of that stuff. Electronic trading, though, as we told you on this program, has done away with the need for a lot of the face-to-face -face wheeling and dealing that you used to see happen. So when the NYSE decided this week to temporarily shut down the floor and move to all electronic trading starting on Monday, there was some notion that not much would really change. But as Marketplace's Justin Ho reports, at the New York Stock Exchange, physical trading does still matter. The roughly 400 traders that mill around on the NYSE trading floor have certain advantages, says Georgetown finance professor James Angel. They're there hanging out with the other traders. They hear things. They see things. They feel things. That kind of information is valuable, especially at the end of the trading session. That's when a special auction helps. Yes. Floor traders can also step in when technology doesn't work. In 2012, a financial firm's trading software accidentally bought and sold hundreds of stocks when markets opened. Justin Schaaf is the head of market structure at Rosenblatt Securities, a big floor broker on New York Stock Exchange. Even though his firm wasn't having the problem, there were folks on the New York Stock Exchange, including some of our people, that were involved with recognizing that and shutting down some of the stocks that had just opened at crazy prices. Shaq says having human traders together in a place where they can see and speak with one another is important during times of stress. And right now, as we're seeing huge market swings day to day, you know, having human beings on the floor is especially important at a time like that. So it's unfortunate that they're not going to be there for Monday. The New York Stock Exchange says its markets are fully capable of operating in an all-electronic fashion. Stacey Cunningham is the NYSE president. Running the New York Stock Exchange fully electronically is something that we've tested with our customers repeatedly. But she says in the long run, the market will benefit when it can return to a combination of trading technology and human judgments. I'm Justin Ho for Marketplace. This is going to sound like kind of a sweeping way to put this, I guess. But this economy right now, as in today, is completely different than it was even like Monday, forget last week. And just like we are still figuring things out, so too are the markets. Details, of course, later, as we say. But today, after a week of historic losses, the Dow, the S&P, and the NASDAQ all closed up. Adina Friedman runs the company that is responsible for that third index that we always talk about. She's the president and CEO of NASDAQ Incorporated. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. First of all, given given the way things have been going the last couple of three weeks, um, how's your mood? time for the economy and for everyone everyone in the economy. I think here at NASDAQ, we've been very focused on making sure that we maintain the safety and health of our employees. And of course, we also maintain the, the functioning of the market. So my mood is energy at the moment. Yeah, I, I bet. I think everybody does. Um, to your mind, are the markets that you are uh, responsible for functioning the way they Volatility aside, are, are the guts of this thing working? Yes, the plumbing of the markets are working very, very well. And I think it is important to note that we've spent years working on improving the resiliency of the U.S. markets. And I do think that it is showing through today across the whole market system, whether it's um, our markets, but also other markets that trade equities, options, futures. Of course, people are finding that there are a lot of stresses in the system. There's a lot of volatility in the markets. We've been hitting record days on multiple occasions, maybe two to three times the amount of volume that we saw just a year ago. But the markets are handling it well, and the plumbing is working well. Let me ask you a question I'm getting all the time, uh, and I know you've got a position on this. Why not, given um, the uncertainty? the fear. Um, panic is a very strong word, but there are days where it feels like that. Why not close the markets and let things settle out and, and then reopen? I think it's really important to remember what the foundation of the markets are and the purpose they serve in the economy. We have um, hundreds of companies out there using the markets to fund their businesses, to fund R&D, and to manage through this very challenging time. If you choke off that access to capital, then you really, then you really do take down a key pillar of the economy. I also, we also have received some questions about whether shorten the market hours. Mm -hmm. If you shorten the market hours, we might have even more pent up demand and, and challenges in those shortened hours. It also creates other risks to other elements of the system, and we do think it's it's really paramount to keep the markets open and operating at normal hours. It, it takes some guts to go public in this environment. 
to the people who are, for some reason, checking their 401ks right now and see the bottom falling out, and, and they say, look, just turn it all off for a little while. Well, I think it's important to recognize what what is a 401k for and over what time period do you need to tap that 401k? So I do think that uh, for younger people and people who are uh, still in the middle of their lives and, and managing through their futures, the 401k is a long-term savings vehicle. Our economy in general is very resilient. A note here that uh, NASDAQ Incorporated is, in fact, a business. These are not terrible times to be in the stock exchange business, are they? Well, I would say that in this period of time with elevated volumes, that is a source of revenue for NASDAQ. Uh, we also really like it when companies go public and have we have a lot of listed companies. So we do want to see a very fast recovery. But we are a resilient business. Um, we have a resilient and, and differentiated business model, and we are very proud of that. Dina Friedman is the president and CEO of uh, NASA. Ms. Friedman, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. So many listener questions, so little time. We have been working all week. Here's another. Hi, this is Ruben Lerner from Mogi in Israel. My question is, what was the economic impact of Spanish flu back in 1918? So, Ruben, I am a student of history, not an actual historian, so we called up Kathleen Day for this one. She teaches at Johns Hopkins Carey Business School with a specialty in financial crises and contagion. People were sick. People were afraid to sometimes go out. So that was 1918, kind of like what we're seeing now, but 100 years ago. So hard economic data wasn't quite like we are used to having today. There are headlines in one Arkansas newspaper that said estimated businesses were losing $10,000 a day in Little Rock. Which translates to something along the lines of $190,000 a day today. But what you got to remember here, Ruben, is that there was something else going on back then as well, which was rattling the economy and society alike. In World War I, to put it in perspective, 100,000 Americans were killed, and the flu pandemic of 1918 to 1920 killed, the estimates are, 675,000 Americans. The war and the flu eventually ended. The economy boomed in the 1920s until that ended, as we all know, with the crash of 29 and the Great Depression. So what portion of that came from excess of people trying to make up for what happened in the pandemic or making up for, for having had to be so frugal during World War One. Hard to say. Hard to say indeed, as is what's going to happen now. Hard to say as well. Kathleen Day at Johns Hopkins there. We thank her for her time. Let us know what you want answered next at marketplace.org or on Twitter. I'm at PyRisto. <laughs> I thought, what better example than me to stand on one side of a window and my dad on the other and say, listen, this is who I could infect. Metaphorical and literal all at the same time. The mind behind and lessons from World War Z. But first, let's do the numbers. So this is a little number we like to call the sad happy news. Seems kind of appropriate, right? The Dow Industrial is up 188 points today, 9 tenths of 1%, 20,087. NASDAQ grows 166 points. I should let the music cool again. 2.3% down on the NASDAQ, 7150. The S&P 500 up 11 points, 4 tenths of 1%, 2409. Crude oil bounced back today after days of steep declines. Analysts, however, were skeptical the rise would continue given the dim economic prospects globally. Also, the price war between the Saudis and the Russians. Chevron, big oil company, gained 4.2 percent. Exxon Mobil rose 3.9 percent. Conoco Phillips banked 12 percent today. Bond rose yield on the 10-year T-note fell just to catch 1.16 percent. You're listening to Marketplace. Hey, listeners, here's another show we think you might enjoy. On Ted's podcast, Work Life, organizational psychologist Adam Grant takes you inside the minds of some of the world's most unusual professionals to discover the science of making work not suck. 
On season three, Adam dives into why we procrastinate with author Margaret Atwood. Here's a hint. The problem isn't laziness, it's emotional regulation. Learn how to procrastinate less, fight burnout, fix broken job interviews, and negotiate better on this season of Work Life. You can find Work Life with Adam Grant wherever you get your podcasts. This is Marketplace. I'm Ty Rizdahl. We get listener emails all the time. Well, often, anyway, telling us how much they enjoy the work that we do. Some not enjoying the work, and that's fine, too. But I mention it because we got one this morning that honestly kind of broke me a little bit. Details not terribly important right now. But the point is, we need each other at this moment. Anxiety and uncertainty are off the charts. And that, to be honest, is probably making it harder for you to do your job if you are lucky enough to still be doing it. All of which is to say, access to mental health care is more important now than ever. Starbucks announced earlier this week every worker is going to be able to get 20 free counseling sessions. A lot of employers are offering resources beyond their traditional health care plans as things develop right now. From the Workplace Culture Desk, this is Megan McCarty Carino has more. Heading for the therapist's physical couch is not an option in our new reality of social distancing. So Andrew Facemeyer was glad when his employer, Northern Arizona University, started offering video counseling. For someone like me who has an anxiety disorder, knowing that I can get a hold of someone is really important because at this time, it's just really easy to get a hold of them. At data analytics firm ThoughtSpot, employees like Candace Locke recently got a subscription to the meditation app Calm. She's been working from home in Mountain View, California for the last two weeks and is now under a shelter-in-place order. She's been using the app several times a day. As soon as I start to focus too much on the news, I then bring it up and just that take a breath is like a good way to reset. Tom Insum, a former head of the National Institute of Mental Health, says programs employers offer outside of traditional health plans are more convenient. You know, they can do this through the company's website. There are a whole series of different companies and different tools that are available, everything from peer support and coaching all the way to one-on-one -on -one therapy. Still, he says, so-called employee assistance programs are often limited at smaller companies and those that employ hourly workers. And of the estimated half of private sector workers with access to these resources, less than 7% typically use them. But Raleigh, North Carolina human resource consultant Lori Rudiman says this crisis could be a turning point. Coronavirus is putting pressure on workers in ways that will really test the well-being not only of the workforce, but the entire society. And that could mean more employers offering and more employees using mental health services. I'm Megan McCurdy, you know, for Marketplace. Great big chunks of this economy are slowing down. They are stopping, in point of fact, with this pandemic. One that's not, thankfully for all of us, is grocery stores. Yes, things are long and socially distant lines, less stuff on the shelves for the moment, but still real consumer demand and need. So we have circled back to some of the people we have been talking to for a year or more now about their buying habits to see what they have noticed as they are stocking up. Hi, this is Kaya Christmas from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Now with the coronavirus starting, my son is back home from college. My daughter is also here. So there are three adults in the house all day, every day, eating three times a day, plus a couple snacks. So we'll see how that goes. One thing I'm very happy about is uh, we buy food in bulk and I can get Chicken breast at $1.69 a pound, whereas if I go to a grocery store or Sam's Club, it's like $2.29 to $2.99 a pound. So we'll see how shopping holds up. This is Ernesto from Chicago. So with everything going on, got some pasta, got some canned goods. Um, it was funny looking at some of the shelves. Everything else is gone, but looking free pasta. So I guess... You know, the idea is that some things will not sell. Not going to be a lot of this is uh, there weren't any fresh vegetables. There was absolutely no meat, and the refrigerated shelves were totally empty. Uh, the frozen food aisles were barren, but at least they did have milk and bread. Uh, I managed to buy a few staples, but 
you know, most of the store brands and name brands of canned goods were gone. So I wound up having to pay a good bit extra for like specialty and organic foods because really it was the only option available. But at the end of the day, I was just, I was happy to be able to leave with what I got. This is Ellen Murphy calling from Mission Hills, Kansas. Hanging up in the hen house grocery store that I went to, it's a sign that says, you know, if you're a laid off worker um, from a restaurant, please come see the manager. So I went to the manager and talked to her and they're, they're trying to get people to work overnight so they can stop. And she said they're not having any trouble getting deliveries. You know, their stuff is still coming in, but they need a lot of people to keep getting that on the shelves. I was Tyler Price Dennis in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Ernesto from Chicago. He asked us not to use his last name. Kelly Koletsky in Columbus, Ohio. And Ellen Murphy, she is in Mission Hills, Kansas. Speaking of store shelves, as we were just there, tune into the Marketplace Morning Report tomorrow. David Brancacci is going to have an interview with a guy who knows a thing or two about supermarkets. Right. And other things that closed, you know, that customers coming to our stores. So the volume has increased, and right now we have over 10,000 openings. Over the last week, we've hired over 2,000 people. Rodney McMullen, he's the CEO of Kroger on the Marketplace Morning Report tomorrow. And coming today in your podcast, we are going daily with Make Me Smart. Me and Molly Wood, the host of Marketplace Tech, she is, of course. What you need to know every afternoon to make today make sense. <laughs> Things right now are not great on a whole lot of levels, but hey, at least it's not the zombie apocalypse, right? But in that apocalypse could lie some lessons. We called up Max Brooks for a chat. He wrote, most notably, World War Z and the Zombie Survival Guide to some perspective on a situation that does feel kind of apocalyptic at the moment. Max, it's good to have you on. Good to be here, Kai. You have talked about your books um, being uh, self-help guides, really, or how-tos. Um, and this seems like an interesting moment uh, for, you, for you to be looking out there and saying, oh, yeah, I wrote about this. Well, you know, I wasn't really trying to predict the future so much as drawing on the past. Uh, World War Z was really based on SARS. So I really wasn't trying to be prophetic in any way. I was simply trying to look at how we had handled disasters throughout our history. You have a side gig too, right? You work at, you, you consult for the, not, who is it? The Army, the Pentagon, who is it? Several. I, I'm, on, I'm a senior non-resident fellow at two think tanks. Uh, and I've also done work for the, of all things, the Blue Ribbon Biodefense Panel, which is trying to get us ready for, of all things, the next pandemic. So what are those lectures like? When you stand up there and say, hey, everybody, I'm Max Brooks, how does that go? Uh, it, it's always the same. I always get a few cocked heads, you know, who is this guy? And then by the end of the lecture, there's always one person who will corner me afterwards and say, listen, I heard what you said, and I need you to come talk to my group. And that's pretty much been the same way since World War Z became reading at the Naval War College. So when these people come to you and say, come talk to my organization, what do you think it is that they want to hear? You know, I think as an outsider, I have the advantage of the big picture. And so I can connect things like science to economics, to national security, to popular culture, because the truth is, it's all connected. Yeah. Um, it, it will be easy to politicize this next answer, and I, and I want you not to do that. Um, okay. Is, is what we're seeing here... And, and look, let me preface this by saying the Trump administration has has fallen down on the job, has only recently um, understood the gravity of this. Is this a failure of government or is it a failure of um, us? I guess? This is a failure of us because we are the government. The Chinese get to blame Xi Jinping. The Iranians get to blame the mullahs. We don't get to blame anybody but who we see in the mirror because if we don't like our leadership, we put them there. And as much as we have a historically unqualified captain of the ship of state, uh, that ship has been rusting underneath us for some time. You know, it, it's not just Trump's fault that we have been dismantling institutions like the CDC. It's not just his fault that we have anti-vaxxers. We, we are to blame as a Democrat 
and on a, on a slightly more upbeat note. Um, you tweeted out a video a day or two ago, whenever it was, um, about about staying on, about um, staying in touch with your dad, but doing it the right way. Your dad, of course, being Mel Brooks. Um, are you? What's the response been to that one? Uh, unbelievable. The last we get something like twelve million views all around the world. Uh, it's just sort of exploded, which is a great thing because all I was trying to do was drive the point home that it's not just about you getting infected; it's who you can infect. You have to think about your loved ones. You have to think about the people who are compromised. So I thought, what better example than me to stand on one side of a window and my dad on the other and say, listen, this is who I could infect. You ought to see it. It's Max Brooks author is his Twitter handle. Um, Max Brooks, Zombie Survival Guide, World War Z, a bunch of other stuff. Max, thanks a lot. I appreciate your time. Okay. Thank you, guys. Take care. Be safe. This final note on the way out today, in which I think Zoom owes me a refund or maybe a marketplace. I don't know. I think they're paying the fee. Anyway, told you yesterday about that touch up my appearance feature that the video conference service offers and how excited I was to try it on our daily Zoom call this morning. Yeah. Click the button, eagerly shifted my eyes up to the screen. Nothing looked exactly the same. Total ripoff. Or Maybe the problem is me. There's always that. Face made for radio. Yeah. All right, we're done. The Dow Delta was up 188 today, nine tenths of one percent. The Nasdaq 160, that is 2.3 percent. The S&P 500 finished the day 11 points higher, four tenths of one percent. Amir Bibawi, John Buckley, Epstein, and John Gordon are the marketplace editing staff. Betsy Streisand is the managing editor. I'm Kyle Rizdal. We will see you tomorrow, everybody. This is APM. This Marketplace podcast is supported by A to Z Wineworks, a B Corporation dedicated to combining commerce with conscience, offering ridiculously food friendly Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris, and Chardonnay. A to Z Wineworks, the essence of Oregon. And by the Alliance for Lifetime Income. Everyone dreams about an active life in retirement. Whether it's learning your hobbies, spending time with family, or traveling, now is the time to start thinking about covering your MUG, which includes essential monthly annuities at protectedincome.org. Part of this thing is that it's unrelenting. Part of it is that it happens so fast, and part of it yeah, is that it's scary. But there is work to do and things to be understood. So, from American public media, this is Marcus. In Los Angeles, I'm Kyle Rizal. It is Friday, today, the 20th day of March. It is always to have you along, everybody. Here is a thought. As we begin, maybe this will be useful to you, maybe not, but it is where I am right now. Time kind of doesn't have an economic meaning at the moment. I mean, yes, days go by, the virus spreads, but this economy, well, really big chunks of it anyway, is shutting down. And if the economy is shutting down, does time have any economic meaning? Which, even as I say that out loud, it's a little bit bleak. So let's not go there, shall we? Let us feel instead of what is right in front of it. I think this is the term economically unbelievable. Neil Richardson is at Edward Jones. Kate Davidson is at the Wall Street Journal. Hey, everybody. Hi. So, Neil, let me start with you on, on a cell phone, obviously, for uh, appropriate social distancing reasons. Um, I heard you, I think it was CNBC this morning, right? That's right. Yeah. At one point, um, we have not yet figured out what the worst of this is. Discuss. Well, if you look at the most recent batch of economic uh, data, it's all been pretty good. I mean, we've gotten really bad data out of China, but domestically speaking, the U.S. labor market was strong in February, and those initial conditions were strong and in place. But over the last few weeks, we've seen a complete deterioration in normal course of life. The fact that we're all sitting in these home offices, not going to bars and restaurants, 
not going to movie theaters, not going to sporting events, not traveling, not going on cruises has a huge economic impact that we haven't seen play out in the data. And we haven't seen play out in terms of uh, corporations uh, earning that for this year. And as that data rolls in, we'll have a better understanding of the the real toll, not just the human toll, which is great, but the economic toll of the pandemic. We got a number from Goldman Sachs either yesterday afternoon or today. They're going to sell it on April the 1st. They're predicting Goldman Sachs, is the guys who study this stuff there, 24% the downside on those metrics. What do you do with that number? How do you wrap your brain? Yeah, it's like talking about the federal debt, right? 23 trillion. What does that even mean? So we've seen that number before. It's really hard to, I think, understand and Right, exactly. So, Neela, talk to me then about that duration part of it, and specifically as it relates to the trillion-dollar bailout bandied about on Capitol Hill. This is, of course, um, Senate Republican Leader Mitch McConnell, trillion dollars plus, maybe a little bit. Um, last number I heard was that it was hundred dollars for individuals and twenty-four hundred dollars for a couple, which in Los Angeles will not cover rent, let alone uh, help them stabilize. It's going to be a uh, time locale. This is actually an actual for the economy. I mean, this was tried during the 2008 financial crisis, giving some kind of funds to households. The capital that a lot of people just ended up saving that money. Um, the more targeted the funds, the more taxable they are. But if people can't go anywhere and can't spend it on anything, it's going to be hard to see how that money goes back into the real economy. And yes, unless it's targeted for people to help pay state expenses like the rent. Los Angeles, maybe half the rent. Yeah, yeah. Kim, let me ask you this. Um, and, and I know the answer before I ask this question. Why is Congress and the White House dithering on getting this done? I mean, we can see the damage happening in the open. I think there's a catch up. I honestly think, um, you know, as I was saying, a couple of weeks ago, people really, even though you could see it in China, then you could see it in Italy. Um, I think again, it was just so hard to grasp how real, um, how real that was. And so we heard plenty of people saying uh, two weeks ago, "You need to pass something to send checks to people right now." But um, I, there, there was this, this view, and there's still a view to some extent that right targeted relief is important, sending stuff to people who need it most. But now I think that there are the conversation is shifting a little bit where right Congress is is kind of uh, dithering a little bit. I mean they're moving quickly for Congress, but they're dithering a little bit over you know making sure we don't give this to billionaires and millionaires and people who don't need it. There's a growing chorus of people saying just send it and we'll figure that out later. Um, we'll claw that back through through taxes. Um, you know when people file next year, let's let's not wait. Let's just do this. Kate Davidson uh, at the Wall Street Journal. Neil Richardson at Edward Jones. Thanks you too. Thanks, Kate. Thank you, Kate. All right. Stay safe out there. On Wall Street today, well, the good news is the markets are going to be closed for 48 hours. The bad news is they're going to open again in 48 hours. We will have the details when we do the numbers. number one of how bad this crisis is going to be is going to come next Thursday when we get the number for what's called first-time claims for unemployment. We've been calling a whole bunch of people about their coronavirus experiences over the past week or so, people who have suddenly lost work. Here they are. My name is Nora Alexanis, 
Anna Brand. My name is Andy Datesman. Um, I'm a cosmetologist. I was working at Great Clips. I am a Spanish to English interpreter. And I'm a New York stage manager. With the public schools closed, um, our work is gone. Every pretty much all of my foreseeable income is up in the air. I'm currently now unemployed. I do have savings, so I'll I'll be able to bridge it, but it's gonna be tight. The First month will feel okay. I'm not sure how the second month will feel, and I know that that's luckier than most right now. I mean, I still have to every week that I have to pay. I make a big difference in my family because I'm one of the only people working. So, like a month being or longer, I mean, I don't know what I would do. You know, I don't. I mean, I need my savings. So, I, um, my son wants to go to graduate school. He wants to be a lawyer. So if I start living off of that money, we're going to have trouble paying for his college. This week, thinking ahead, I have to pick between my prescribing psych and just my regular therapist. Because spending $200 each per appointment this week is just not, I think, the best idea. But nobody knows how long this is going to last, you know? I'm looking forward to what's going to be certainly tightened the belts. That was Norma Alexander in New York City. Andy Gates from Walpole, Massachusetts, on a brand in uh, Bakersfield, California. You can tell us about your coronavirus economy at marketplace.org. If this is Friday, and it is, I bet you've got questions about what's going on in this economy right now, because, I mean, Come on, right? Send them to us. I'm on Twitter at uh, Rizdal. There's a link also on our website, marketplace.org. Here's question number one. Hey, Kai. My name is Ty Cotton. I'm a home Nebraska, and I have a question from Marketplace. I see some people on Facebook and other places equating the Fed's cash and fees. I don't believe it's the same, but it's all very confusing. Any help with this would be great. Thank you. All right, good question, and no, they are not the same thing. Back in the financial crisis, after Lehman Brothers collapsed, Henry Paulson, who was then the Secretary of the Treasury, used a bunch of the $700 billion in that's the Troubled Asset Relief Program, if you remember that, right, to inject new capital into the big Wall Street banks to make sure they had enough cash to keep operating. Paulson has said on this program that he did it to keep the economy from collapsing. Others, of course, disagree. We honestly don't have enough air time to have that debate. What the Federal Reserve did last week, when it put a trillion and a half dollars into a very particular slice of the financial system, the overnight big bank lending markets. First of all, Fed's balance sheet, it's not actual cash that gets added to the national debt. And number two, it's not like the Fed just said, hey, big banks, here's a trillion and a half dollars, put it down. The Fed has lent some portion of that money out. Yes, and in return, the banks handed over the highest possible quality collateral they had, U.S. Treasury bonds. This is a totally confusing one. I get that. But what the Fed did a week ago and what the 2008 bailout was of the big banks, they are not the same thing. We are still, believe it or not, way in the early days of this crisis. And how the government responds, and it is finally responding in full, will depend in great measure on what tools it has. Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin said last week that he thinks he and other regulators are going to need more tools than they have right now. Tools that will take away after the financial crisis. But this is Sabri Benishore has me. After the Great Recession, there was a backlash. People were upset that the Fed had come to the rescue of some firms outside the banking system, but not others. So Dodd Frank took away some of that power and created a new rule that said, the Fed can't pick and choose who gets help. Roughly speaking, they have to give it to everybody in that way. John Cochran is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. He says the idea was to prevent the Fed from getting sucked down into the mucky, dirty business of picking winners and losers. He gives this example. So the airlines are going to get in trouble. There will be an airline bailout package, and there will be a populist backlash for that. The Federal Reserve should not be the one making that call. It's going to stay a politically independent technocratic agency. Better, he says, for politicians to make those kinds of decisions. Donald Lampson disagrees. He's a lawyer and an independent consultant who worked on parts of Dark, right? He says Congress went too far in hamstringing the Fed. This was one of the major mistakes that uh, Congress made. He says he'd rather have experts at the Fed decide whether a company needs help. He says they can do so quickly. 
There are plenty of ways in the professional finance at Stanford's Graduate School of Business and this is a Suppose some individual non-bank were to get into serious trouble financially and were it to fail, it would create a real crater on the economy. The current rules, the Fed would not be able to step in. Can't help one company, gotta help them all. The Fed would just have to put on its hands until it developed into a more significant crisis than multiple firms were in trouble. The new coronavirus and efforts to contain it threaten to take down industries and firms, and some will need emergency loans. The issue of whether to return power to the Fed is ultimately about who's going to pick, who gets that help, who's going to hand it out, and how quickly they can do it. In New York, I'm Sibri Benishore, to Marketplace. We heard a little bit ago from people who have lost their jobs or had their hours cut because of this crisis. And that is terrible for them, to be clear. But for people running businesses, there can be an economic and emotional toll as well. My name is Brian Newman. Uh, my wife and I live in New Haven, Connecticut. We own two three-family homes rigged up as Airbnb apartments. My name is Jeanette Harney, and I'm the operations director for Kakao Cafe and 415 Westlake, a place and coffee shop in South Lake Union in the heart of Seattle. My name is Michael Alexander. I am the owner and operator of the Nine Round in downtown LA. The uh, franchise is a 30 minute full body kickboxing workout circuit program. It was a devastating time to have to let go of staff. We were using this kind of retirement fund. We are uh, vulnerable to the virus. So far, we've been lucky. In our apartments, we now have five travel investors. So they're usually careful. I can't help you. I can't do anything but say, really sorry, your job is no longer here until there's a neighborhood to serve coffee to. My first day of opening was February 19th. And here we are. It's because I had to tell my employees well, unemployment. <laughs> That was Brian Noonan. He's in New Haven, Connecticut. Jeanette Hardy is in Seattle. Michael Alexander is here in Los Angeles. Today, I took the day to mail birthday cards to any of my students who have birthdays in the coming weeks. An act of kindness from a teacher in Milwaukee before that feel-good moment, because we have to. Let's do the numbers. All right, here we go. The Dow Industrial is up 913 points today, 4.5%, 19,173. The Nasdaq down 271 points, 3.7%, 6879. The S&P 500 down 104 points, 4.3%, 4 finished at 2304. For the five days gone by, obviously, the three major indices posted their biggest drop since October 2008. Financial crisis this week, the Dow down 17%, down 12%, the S&P 500 down 15 A little bit of good news, actually, in the travel sector. Hertz up 23% today. Carnival Cruise Lines up 20%. Royal Caribbean Bank 6% today. Bond prices rose. Yield on the 10-year T-note to 0.87%. You're listening to Marketplace. I'm Eddie McLeese, host of Marketplace's podcast being impacted in a really the other day. My sister told me that she was let go. I felt like kind of like failed. I didn't do anything wrong. Like, mm -hmm. and so when I got that, I was just like, crap, I'm out of a job. Like, what do I do? On the show, we get into coping with COVID-19. Episode drops every Thursday. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, everybody. It's Kai. I know it is hard to keep up with what is happening right now in this economy. I get it. But that is why Molly Wood and I just launched a brand new 10-minute daily Make Me Smart podcast to help make today make sense. It comes out late in the day, about 5 o'clock Pacific, 8 o'clock Eastern. And also, you should subscribe. Get the Make Me Smart podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, listeners. Here's another show we think you might enjoy. On Ted's podcast, work-life organizational psychologist Adam Grant takes you inside the mind of some of the world's most unusual professionals to discover the science of making work not suck. On season three, Adam dives into why we procrastinate with author Margaret Atwood. Here's a hint. The problem isn't laziness, it's emotional regulation. Learn how to procrastinate less, fight burnout, fix broken job interviews, and negotiate better on this season of Work Life. 
You can find Work Life with Adam Grant wherever you get your podcasts. This is Marketplace. I'm Kai Rudolph. There is perhaps no business or economic phrase more familiar to the general public in this country than too big to fail, other than maybe bailout, right? So as Congress and the White House continue to hammer out the details of the trillion-dollar relief package, one question is what kind of strings ought to be attached to any corporate bailout money? Democrats and their allies are pushing for a ban on share buybacks as a condition of any assistance. A lot of Republicans say they are opposed to limits on buybacks, although President Trump said yesterday he would be okay with such a condition. Fact is, though, that after the GOP's 2017 tax cuts, companies spent billions of dollars buying back their own stock at the expense of making other investments. So Marketplace's Amy Scott explains the 2020 version of the bailout buyback debate. On the Senate floor earlier this week, Minority Leader Chuck Schumer summed up the backlash. One of the reasons, let's not forget, that many airlines are so short of cash on stock buybacks. Money they had to send out when they should have been saving it for a rainy day. In the last decade, according to Bloomberg, the big U.S. airlines spent more than 95% of their free cash flow buying back their own shares. Companies do this to boost their stock price and reward shareholders and executives because airlines aren't alone. Irene Tung is a senior researcher at the National Employment Law Project. In most industries, a majority of companies are spending more than 50% of their profits on buybacks. And that's sort of a central weakness of the U.S. economy right now as we go into this economic downturn. Not just because companies don't have enough rainy day funds, but because their workers don't. If companies had been paying workers more, then people wouldn't be living paycheck to paycheck you know, the way that they are now, leaving them as vulnerable as they are when all of a sudden that paycheck disappears. But buybacks don't just enrich shareholders and company executives. Rick Marshall researches corporate governance at MSCI. The money goes out to investors who, by and large, are reinvesting this in other companies. This is all money that's returning back into the larger economy. Charles Elson teaches governance at the University of Delaware. He says the blame on buybacks is misplaced. And even had you not bought any stock back, you would never have had enough cash on hand to support the kinds of revenue declines that we're seeing. You're talking 60, 70 percent decline in revenue. That's catastrophic. And he says, unlike the bank bailouts during the financial crisis, this particular catastrophe wasn't his fault. I'm Amy Scott for Marketplace. About that last line from Amy, about companies not being at fault for this present economic catastrophe, that is totally true. They are not. But we can't pretend the past couple of five years in this economy hasn't happened. Boeing has bought back $43 billion worth of its share since 2013. Money it could have come in handy right now as the company leads the charge for a $60 billion aerospace industry bill. The argument being made is that Boeing is critically important to the American economy and that if it collapses, that would be felt all through American manufacturing. Marketplace Jack Stewart took a look at whether Boeing really is too big to fail. You know how sometimes the more opinions you ask for, well, the more different opinions you get? Not in this case. In my opinion, yes, I think it is too big to fail. The industry is too big to fail. Boeing, of course, is a key part of that. Yes, that's absolutely correct. It is too big to fail. Let's start with the last voice you just heard. That was Bijan Basir at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. He says Boeing's importance to the U.S. economy can't be overstated. Air transportation, including aircraft manufacturing, if it was a country, was the fifth biggest economy in the world. Boeing is a huge part of that, along with its suppliers. Richard Abulafia is an aviation analyst at Teal Group. The bulk of the jobs involved are actually in the supply chain. Uh, it's tremendously complicated to build a jetliner, and there are lots of uh, individual subcontractors, each with their own workforces. He says, take the 737 MAX, for example. The body comes from Spirit Aerosystems in Wichita, Kansas. GE builds the engines in Evendale, Ohio, along with a French company. And Boeing is also a space and defense company, building everything from fighter jets to a new spacecraft designed to take astronauts to the International Space Station. They are a huge provider of government services. Arthur Wheaton is with the Worker Institute at Cornell. Boeing employs around 150,000 people directly, but in its call for government support, it says it relies on the broader aerospace industry with 2.5 million jobs. 
Wooten says it's important to protect specialized, highly trained workforce. You start shutting Boeing down, you start losing those employees, you start laying them off, then you could be hurting by decades the capacity of the United States to start building other planes when things or if things pick up. Boeing is America's biggest exporter, strengthens the argument that it is too big to fail. I'm Jack Stewart for Marketplace. about question number two? This is Sid Stoll from Orlando, Florida. When will we know that we're moving back to normal? Is there an indicator we should follow or an announcement we should wait for? We all seem to be waiting for the light at the end of the tunnel without knowing what the light actually is. So this is a good one because A, there is going to be an end to this and it's important to remember that, but also number two, While we might be able to get good and near real-time data on the virus, we are not going to know that we're moving back to economic normal until we are well on our way. And here's what I mean. Think back to the crisis again, okay? Lehman Brothers collapsed in September of 2008. The market didn't bottom out until March of 2009. And we didn't find out until September of 2009 that the recession had officially ended in June. So... All of that said, if you want one thing to keep an eye on, look at jobs for sure, the unemployment rate. If we have learned anything this week, and it's a lesson that is going to have to keep on giving honestly, it's that there can still be a lot of good happening out there. So here are some of the ways people have been trying to make all this my name is uh, Yeo Vang, chef and owner of Union Mung Kitchen here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. My name is Jocelyn Diaz. I live in Longwood, Florida, and I'm a freelancer mostly. Um, I do production work, so concerts. My name is Jennifer Koss. I am from Milwaukee, and I currently teach high school English. I'm looking for ways to just brighten people's days a little bit. Yesterday, I took the day to mail birthday cards to any of my students who have birthdays in the coming weeks. So my roommate, um, he's already told me that, you know, if I can't make rent, then not to really worry about it. So he's been really understanding about it. It's really cool. We had uh, a family who got in contact with us and they said, hey, I uh, want to use you as a caterer for our, our son's uh, bar mitzvah. And it was, you know, it was cool. And Right after they got done paying for it, literally the next day they called and they said, we actually don't want the money back. What we really want to do is we want you to be able to take care of your guys. That was Ia Vong of the Union Among Kitchen in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Jennifer Koshi is a teacher in Milwaukee and Jacqueline Diaz is a stage production freelancer in Longwood, Florida. This final note on the way out today to be added to the list of things that, despite our best efforts, just are not making sense right now. Maybe you saw this already, but the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are going to pay Tom Brady, it has been reported, $60 million to play football for two years. Don't at me here, but first of all, come on, $60 million for two years? Also, this is kind of like Joe Montana in the Chiefs jersey, right? Or going way back, Joe Namath playing for the Rams? All right, we're done. The Dow off 913 points today, 4.5%. The NASDAQ down 271 points, 3.7%. The S&P 500 off 104 points, 4.3%. Our theme music was composed by B.J. Lederman. Marketplace's executive producer is Nancy Pargali. Nancy Cassett is the managing director of news. Deborah Clark is the senior vice president and general manager. I'm Kai Rizdahl. We will see you Monday, everybody. Have a great day. Stay party. important, man. This is APM.
This message comes from NPR sponsor State Farm. Mobile app, your agent's knowledge and services are at your fingertips. Pay your bill, file and track claims, and more. When you need your agent on hand, like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. I'm Elsa Chang in Culver City, California, where residents have been ordered by the governor to stay home. Other states say they are taking similar steps. So we might in Washington, the president, Vice President Mike Pence, other officials briefed reporters for about 90 minutes today on the latest in the government response to the coronavirus, including the U.S. has closed the Mexico border to all non-essential travel. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo told reporters that U.S. citizens who are abroad should return to the U.S. or be prepared to remain outside the country for a long period of time. Also, Americans now have until July 15th to file their taxes. Okay, so after more of what we learned in today's briefing, I want to bring in our roundtable. NPR's Aisha Roscoe covers the White House, Chief Economics Correspondent Scott Horsley, and Science Correspondent Richard Harris. Hello, team. Hi. Hi, Mary Louise. Uh, Richard Harris, we're going to hit the science first today. There was a lot of back and forth in this briefing between the president and Tony Fauci, the infectious disease expert, who's one of his top advisors. Uh, The back and forth was over a malaria drug that could possibly be a treatment for COVID-19. Dr. Fauci, though, tempered expectations over whether the drug could help. The answer is is no. And, And the information that you're referring to specifically is anecdotal. It was not done in the control of clinical trial. So you really can't make any definitive statement about it. But President Trump was not deterred. He says he has a feeling this might work. I sure as hell think we ought to give it a try. I mean, there's been some interesting things happen and some good, very good things. Uh, let's see what happens. We have nothing to lose. You know the expression? What the hell do you have to lose? All right, Richard Harris, I won't repeat the president's <laughs> question there, but what, what is this drug and, and it's promising? Well, it, uh, the short answer is nobody really knows how promising it is. Researchers sensibly started looking around for drugs that are approved for one use and thought might be useful against the Is that a drug that targets the parasite that causes malaria would actually work against a virus like coronavirus? But, you know, uh, it, there have been some, uh, there's been a bit of hype around it and some very preliminary observations that uh, Dr. Fauci alluded to. The problem is you don't really want to have a stampede for something that doesn't actually work. And as Dr. Fauci pointed out, there's, there's so little information about potential safety concerns for this drug, especially among people who are suffering severe lung infection as a result of the coronavirus. So, uh, you know, we're kind of in this weird spot between hype and hope. And uh, and uh, I and I think that uh, Dr. Fauci was trying to keep it grounded in the science, and uh, the president was trying to just go with the hope. Uh, Aisha, you were there in the White House briefing room as this played out. So talk about the optics, this back and forth between the president and Dr. Fauci. It, it was striking. President Trump is not used to having uh, at all, especially not to his face on really anything of what matters at this moment is because we're talking about decisions that are matters of life and death and of such huge magnitude. Yeah. So having the administration kind of speak with one voice and deliver clear messages or not speak with one voice is significant. Fauci did seem to kind of nod to this tension. He was saying that he did think there was really a big difference between what he was saying and what Trump was saying. And that's probably important for him to remain in good standing with Trump. Uh, Richard, there were questions about supplies today, about ventilators, whether there are enough ventilators. Make sure that this is very important. In our recent discussion with uh, anesthesiologists, we literally identified tens of thousands of existing ventilators that can be retrofitted and converted to be ventilators for people struggling with the coronavirus. Retrofitted and converted. But how does that work? Is it vital? Well, it actually could work. It could make a big difference. I talked to Dr. Mary Dale Peterson, who's the president of the American Society of Anesthesiologists, and she explains that these devices are used to provide anesthesia in the Basically, those devices can be fitted with filters and all of their systems can be adjusted. They actually could work fine in the intensive care unit with people who really understand how to make it happen. And she says there's as many as 70,000 of these devices uh, American hospitals. Obviously, some have to stay in the operating room because people will still need emergency surgery and one. But she thinks maybe half of them uh, could be repurposed. So mm-hmm. this doesn't solve the problem of ventilator shortage, but it's a it's a really big number that helps alleviate that. Um, all this talk about supply of ventilators and so on has prompted questions about the Defense Production Act. 
Aisha Roscoe remind us what is the Defense Production Act and, and has it been activated or not? So this is a law that first came about in World War II, then it was revived during the Cold War. It allows the president to control the production and distribution of scarce materials that have been deemed essential to the national defense. So the government can uh, direct industries to prioritize certain production and the government can say uh, it has the right to buy certain goods before anyone else. Uh, the president yesterday said he had not activated it yet. Um, he was hoping he would not have to use this act at this moment. But then today, Trump kind of gave actually directed companies to begin producing ventilators and masks. I did ask him, ask him, could he name any of these companies? And he said he would have to check with them. He did name General Motors as one of the companies that may be helping to make ventilators. I followed up with the White House and I still haven't gotten a clear answer about whether this is happening under the Defense Production Act or not, or whether it's officially been triggered. Hmm. Uh, Scott Horsley, thank you for your patience. Sorry to keep you waiting. This is the perfect moment to bring you in because you've also specifically for businesses. Which you mentioned, and others that would actually have to manufacture all these things. Yeah, we've seen this in other countries. You know, in China, there was an auto plant that started turning out face masks. In Europe, there's a cosmetic factory that switched to making hand sanitizer. So it is doable, but there are challenges. You know, one of the reasons that GM and the other automakers shut down this week is it's hard to maintain social distance in a factory. So you want to be able to keep your workers safe. You also have to wonder can the companies get the supplies they need, especially if you're talking about a complex product like a ventilator. So manufacturers can be adaptable, but they do need some coordination, and we haven't seen very much of that just yet. Hmm. Um, another question for you, Scott. The Mexico border closing that I mentioned. A lot of workers cross that border. What impact are we expecting? Yeah, as with the closing of the Canadian border, authorities appear to be mostly cracking down on tourist travel. They say essential travel will still be allowed, and people with work permits can still go back and forth. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said the U.S. is particularly interested in making sure that seasonal agricultural workers, those with H-2A visas, can keep coming into the United States. Kind of a reminder that as much as the president sometimes demonizes our neighbors to the south, there are big parts of the U.S. economy that are still heavily dependent on Mexican neighbors. Yeah. Hey, lightning round, final thought from each of you. We've been talking to you every day. Is this extraordinary? What's your thoughts? Well, uh, this is my final thought of reflecting on the week. We understandably look to scientists and drug companies to rescue us with medicines and vaccines. But the reality is this week, it's Americans and all of us working together to really make a difference. And to maintain that, we need credible, consistent, fact-based advice to people. Thanks. Thanks, Roscoe. This is the first week of this uh, kind of 15 days of the administration trying to get people socially uh, distancing and trying to see if it will work. So my thought is, what's going to happen next week? And are we going to really see the difference uh, from these two weeks of people doing the social show social distancing? Of course, the last one. Well, I've been getting a lot of emails and phone calls this week from friends across the country just uh, checking in. I've been making a lot of calls like that myself and sending, sending emails. I think it's really important at a time when so many of us are physically isolated that we make an effort to stay connected in other ways. I'm afraid that so many Americans are doing And Pierre Scott Horsley, Asia Rosco, and Richard Harris. Thanks to all three of you. Thank you. Crowding into mosques for Friday worship is a tough story for Muslims around the world, but this morning, is unprecedented. For the first time in Muslim history, communities ranging from Kenya to Saudi Arabia, from Britain to Kuwait, have shuttered or curtailed access to mosques. Not so in Pakistan, where clerics were declined. And here's Dia Hadith reports from Islamabad. Many of these the mosques for Friday prayers in this Islamabad suburb. They're dressed in their mosque clothes. The ground floor of Pakistan. Others climbed up a spiral staircase to find space upstairs. The preachers began the sermon. Pakistan has taken a piecemeal approach to the coronavirus pandemic. In some provinces, shops are closed. In others, big gatherings are banned. There's a shortage of protective gear for health workers. And doctors warn this pandemic will overwhelm this country. Two hundred fifty million people. 
The clerics here sank the most of the state of them, shutting them down but in by God's anger at a time when the name of his mercy. Salah Muhammad relies on his motorbike. He's here to find solace, and in a mosque, his prayer will be heard. Uh, we are coming here because God says, when you are in trouble, come to me, I will help you out. So, Sadiq Bhatt is a retired civil servant, and he says things can't be that bad. He says if the pandemic was serious, the government would have shut down all the mosques. Mosques belonging to Pakistan's Shiite minority are closing. They're heeding the call of prominent Shiite clerics. And leaving Pakistanis, including the president, are urging people to stay home. The critics say the government fears angering powerful religious groups, so they won't enforce a ban. Those groups partly rely on mosque donations for funds. As we report, a woman walks up to us. I was just talking to you, and I saw you, so I just came over here to know what's going on over here. Fatma Maraj says the mosques have to stay open, but with precautions. You are not buying the food from the uh, market? Will you stop that? No. If we cannot stop eating, if we cannot uh, stop uh, drinking water, so how can we stop uh, going to the uh, mosque? She says this is a religious country. And here, an act of faith is as essential as drinking water. Dear Hadid, NPR News is all about it. Asked yesterday about the government's preparedness for the COVID-19 outbreak, President Trump said this. Nobody knew there'd be a pandemic or an epidemic of this proportion. Nobody's ever seen anything like this before. Actually, not quite. You see, people inside the federal government predicted last year that the U.S. would be underfunded, underprepared, and too disorganized to deal with a global pandemic. They had conducted a simulation of a flu pandemic, a host of problems which have now been reported for the first time in the New York Times. One of the reporters on that story is National Security Correspondent David Sanger. Welcome. Good to be with you. So this exercise, this simulation that you guys reported on, it was codenamed Crimson Contagion. Can you briefly explain what it was? It was an effort to uh, do a tabletop simulation of what would happen if there was an extremely severe uh, uh, flu pandemic that swept through the United States. Actually, on one of the early charts in the 70 or so pages of, of a draft report that came out of this, uh, it showed that the pandemic would be the most severe that the U.S. has faced since the Spanish flu in 1918. And, and it was based on uh, questions of how prepared hospitals would be, how prepared different cities would be, and as you suggested in the in the introduction, it then pointed out all kinds of, of difficulties. All yeah, of tell us about those. Tell us about those yeah. difficulties, the parallels you're seeing today versus what they saw in the simulation. Well, first, a difference of opinion about when to close schools. We've certainly seen that. Uh, second, uh, an overwhelming number of hospitalizations. The uh, the simulation suggested that in the environment they imagined, there would be 110 million people roughly who came down with this, 7.7 .7 million of whom would require hospitalization, and 586,000 would die. So that's a, a pretty stark number, and then leads you to the next question, are we ready to do 7.7 .7 million hospitalizations? And what did the government learn back uh, then? Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, what's interesting about this is this isn't just what was left over by the Obama administration, although they did leave uh, both a study and a simulation uh, for the uh, for the Trump administration. This was done by President Trump's own Department of Health and Human Services in disaster and preparedness um, uh, agency. Yes. Um, what's interesting is the report, as we got it, was marked draft, sensitive, not for distribution. I didn't find any evidence that a final report ever came out. And they wouldn't answer that question. So it's very possible that the results were startling enough that they didn't really want to have a final report out. But just to recap what you guys found in this, the government realized that hospitals would be struggling to figure out what kind of equipment was to stockpile, there would be available cities and states were struggling to decide when to close schools. So 
just to be clear, this exercise showed that the Trump administration modeled a global pandemic and predicted many of the same problems that you will see on the map. That's absolutely right. And good credit to them that they were spending a lot of time modeling this. This was not a short simulation. It ran on and off between January and August. It focused on Chicago or the other cities. Biggest of the hotspots we've heard about lately, but it was an interesting model to produce. And it laid out exactly the decision tree that the presidents had to go through. So, what does this tell you? Either that it didn't float up to the president, we know the National Security Council was involved in this simulation, or it tells you that it did float up and it was the basis on which members of the uh, Department of Health and Services and others were advising the president about the course that this would take. And that would have been back in January, right. around the time when you were saying we had five. Cut in now. You asked the White House about this currently. What did the White House say it did once it discovered all these problems that were revealed in the simulation in the last 30 seconds? Sure. They didn't say whether or not they had been briefed on it, but they did know that, the, uh, that there was a flu in that case and a virus in this case. And they said, well, that's very different. Maybe that they're different diseases, but they have similar, very similar problems. All right, that is David Singer of the New York Times. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. The last man on the street, comedian Mal Sharp, died earlier this month at the age of eight. Starting in the 1950s, Sharp would dress in a business suit and wander the streets of San Francisco with another serious-looking man. Together, they would approach unsuspecting strangers. Now, today I'll stop the young man. Your name, please? Michael Ruffman. Michael, uh, I'd like you to meet James P. Coyle. Mr. Coyle is a werewolf. I don't think we care to see something like that, but... Can we go ahead? I don't know. I... Mel Sharp there with his partner, the late Jim Coyle. They perfected this ambush style of comedy long before TV hosts like Billy Bigger and Mel Sharp posed as a reporter. Only he asked questions no real reporter ever would. In one routine, he asked people if they would take a dead person to a ball game. In another, during the water game, he asked lawyers on the steps of the U.S. Supreme Court to name their favorite fish. Sharp's Man on the Street routines were a regular part of NPR's programming in the 1980s and 90s. Longtime listeners of this program might remember his off-filtering dispatches, like this one in 1988 outside the Democratic Convention in Atlanta. We're right outside the Omni with continuing coverage of the Democratic National Convention. Has anybody been talking to you about the moon? About the moon? Don't you think maybe this is the year to find out what's going on with the moon? No, not particularly, for the simple fact that we can't get along together down here. Why try to expand it somewhere else? And then there's this, Sharp's contribution to NPR's coverage of the 200th anniversary of the Bill of Rights, 1991. Well, a lot of people want to get rid of the Third Amendment. How about you? Third Amendment rights? Third Amendment. Do we have one? Yeah. Are you a lawyer? Third Amendment. I am. Soldiers cannot be housed in a private home without the consent of the owner. Oh, well, gee, that's good to know. Have you ever had one case where a client has come to you and wants to exercise the Third Amendment rights? I've never had somebody come and claim that they've got souls to hang out in their living room that they can't get rid of. <laughs> Those on this program got to know Mal Sharp's humor and more. He was tall and sweet, and he really liked going up to strangers and talking to them. For him, it was more than a joke. You know, you can get into the nooks and crannies of society when you just walk around with a tape recorder and a microphone. And I hope that I just kind of reveal the people and the incidents uh, in, in a manner that you might not normally see it. It's almost, I think, kind of like audio photography, I guess. The last one on the poster. Sure. At the age of 80. Sure. I'm actually at the top of the culture steps here, which during normal times is a destination for a lot of people who live in LA. Because once you press this gorgeous hill, you get to take in this sparkling panoramic view of the whole city. But today, it's pretty quiet. You hear more birds chirping and people talking. And we came up here because we wanted to check in with some people who 
even though they're under stay-at-home orders in California, they managed to get out to get in some exercise and some sunshine. I want to be frank, but I can't really put this thing over. Yeah, when that stay-at-home order came down last night, what were the first thoughts that went through your head? I literally, like, the, the idea of feeling, like, put on timeout or in detention or, like, it just kind of, I don't know, I'm battling that a little bit. Um, I've been, like, cooking more, taking care of, like, my self-care more, a little bit, like, so... All right, we all got the stay-at-home order in California, but you guys came out here. Tell me why. We've been working out. It's just like a thing that we usually do all the time. We usually go into it. Uh-huh, exactly. Um, so now that they're both in, like, we have nothing to do, so why not come and, and like, take a walk or take a hike or something? How has your life changed in the last several days? A lot. Uh, no, no work. My company shut down, so we haven't been working for the last week. What kind of work do you do? Uh, security. So every everything shut down, no time for to go back. You know, I had a lot of bills to pay, and yeah, a lot of uncertainty. Do you think the governor made the right call? I think so, because like a lot of people weren't taking it serious. I mean, my friends were like, oh, let's go, 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 let and just to note, hiking and exercising outside is still perfectly fine under the governor's orders in California. Here to explain more about those orders is in here's Adrian Florida. He's in Culver City with me. Hey, Adrian. Hi, Elsa. All right, so remind us, what was Governor Newsom's order exactly, and how did he explain why he's taking responsibility? So the governor's order means stay home. You know, if you don't need to go outside to get food or to get medicine or, or be careful, you know, just stay home. Uh, now, the orders you found this morning, people are still going outside, especially for exercise, mm-hmm. which is are telling people it's okay for their distance. Um, the governor also ordered most businesses across the state to close, except for those providing essential services. In terms of why he's doing this, he, he's worried uh, about uh, coronavirus patients overwhelming the state's healthcare system. When he announced the order yesterday, he said that some projections show more than half of the state's 40 million residents could get sick. Which would mean a massive shortage of hospital beds and, and many deaths, and that's what he wants to avoid. Well, I mean, the state is extremely complicated. I imagine that enforcement of this order is going to be really, really complicated and tough. So, what have officials said about how they will enforce this order? They've been a little bit vague about enforcement. Uh, here in Los Angeles, the county sheriff has said that he does not plan to make arrests to enforce the government's order. And, and Governor Newsom himself said that he actually thinks the greatest enforcement tool. It's going to be uh, peer pressure. We, we heard some of that from the woman who spoke mm-hmm. at the top, who was discouraging her friends from getting together. I mean, California is the country's largest state. There's almost 40 million people living here, including you and me. What are some of the challenges in dealing with a crisis like this coronavirus pandemic that might be specific to the state? So, a very big, a big one even, even before the coronavirus crisis, California was in the homelessness crisis. You, you drive the length of the state using homelessness in communities that have never struggled with it before. And so officials know that unhoused people are among the most vulnerable during this crisis because they often live in the community, they have pre-existing conditions, they don't have easy access to showers, hand washing facilities. Uh, in recent days, officials here in LA announced plans to get thousands of people off the streets and the new uh, makeshift shelters and hotels. And earlier today, I saw them setting up uh, mobile showers near parks. Another big challenge is one that we're seeing across the country, healthcare workers here in the state saying they don't have enough of the equipment and supplies they need to stay safe. Masks, gloves, goggles. Uh, earlier this month, Governor Newsom got approval from the CDC to use masks that the state has in reserve, but a lot of those are past their use by date. Uh, but, you know, they're saying this crisis is so big, we can't let the spiral out of control. So, so these uh, supplies we have are, are better than nothing. That is NPR's Adrian Florido on the latest in California. Thank you, Adrian. Thanks, Jessica. And let's go next to New York, where the governor has instituted similar restrictions. New York now leads the nation in known coronavirus infections, about 8,000 cases, most of them in New York City, which is where we find the first four lines. So what are these restrictions that Governor Cuomo has announced? Um, you called it New York being on pause. It's a software way of saying it's on lockdown. 
um, non-essential businesses should be shut. Everyone should stay home. There are a lot of essential businesses, though. I think it would be in health and food and restaurants, groceries, pharmacies. Um, he said that individuals should stay home. Groups that are found outside will be told to disperse, ordered to disperse. He said those who are over 70 should just not leave their homes, wear masks if they do. And Cuomo said he knew this was going to cause an enormous Some people say that we don't need to do this. Uh, it's going to hurt the economy. I understand that. This is about saving lives. And if everything we do saves just one life, I'll be happy. Yeah. He says he'll be happy, but I want to know that the mayor of New York City, Bill de Blasio, was on our member station at the UNIC today, and he was sounding a, a very different tone, much less diplomatic. Right. De Blasio was clearly angry on the radio this morning. I mean, seeing the same growing urgency that the, the governor is, but what he was saying is that the, the federal action just hasn't been there. He said he's been asking everyone from the VA secretary to the vice president, uh, asking the White House to adjust hasn't heard and hasn't seen their help coming in, he blames the president. They're not responding and they're not responding either out of ignorance or they're not responding on purpose, which I think history is going to judge very harshly. And, you know, we're, we're talking about, ironically, a New Yorker who so right now is betraying New York City. De Blasio had been pushing for a while for shelter in place, and Cuomo didn't use those words, but essentially that's what he called for. They're both seeing the same dire numbers and estimates that New York will, at some point in the near future, have doubled the number of patients as it has been, maybe triple the number of ventilators, uh, or rather triple the number of patients who need ventilators that there are available. Huh. It, just before I let you go, Carl, what does it feel like in New York? I'm, I'm struggling to imagine a New York City on pause, anything other than vibrant and allowed. Yeah, I mean, there, we're in weird, different world. There are places that you can jaywalk right now that I never would have dreamed of crossing the street before. Um, some families are on lockdown and you know, talking to their friends over uh, Skype. Um, kids playing basketball, um, oblivious. Uh, and I think medical professionals in particular are living in a third reality, which is something of the future, knowledge of what's to come. Unless there's a real Herculean effort to increase capacity. All right. Thank you, Quill. Internet traffic is surging. Companies around the world are sending workers home. Cities are shutting down all but essential services. As America hunkers down, will there be enough online capacity for our newly isolated digital lives? And here's tech correspondent Shannon Bond. More people are shifting to the digital world these days as life outside the home is put on hold. It's already playing out in South Korea and Italy. People are watching videos, playing games, and reading lots of online news. So they shifted into doing more online chat, more video streaming, which almost doubled in those countries, more visits to news sites, which went up 30 to 60 percent online gaming. Matthew Prince is CEO of Cloudflare, an internet infrastructure and security company. Here in the U.S., internet traffic jumped 20% late last Friday after President Trump heard a national emergency. In Seattle, traffic is running 40% higher than anywhere. In his video chats for place face to face meetings, peak internet use is happening in the middle of the workday. Usually, that peak would happen kind of in the evening when people get home and start watching Netflix. And in Seattle, what we're seeing is that is now happening at 11 a.m. local time. With so many people working outside of their offices, that's putting a strain on computer networks. Luke Gaiman is a research scientist at the University of Copenhagen in Denmark. He usually spends his day in the lab, but his university told everyone to start working from home last week. Gaiman told me he was studying the figure he gets right in the middle of the chat. But when he went to log on, I basically failed at the first level, which was connected to the university uh, APA. Universities, companies, and other organizations use virtual private networks, or VPNs, to let workers securely access their systems, even if they're not in the office. Cloudflare's Matthew Prince explains. You can think of it as almost a castle and mobile strategy, where all the employees and all the secrets of the business are in the castle, and the bad guys are kept out through the mode. He says VPNs are like drawbridges, 
that let certain people into the castle, like employees who are on the road. Those drawbridges, they were never built to accommodate the entire workforce being outside of the castle. Castles are emptying out everywhere. As cities ban non-essential gatherings, schools close down, and many employees are ordered to work from home. It's a big test for companies whether their systems can handle such an abrupt shift. Patrick Sullivan is Chief Technology Officer for Security at Akamai, which delivers web content. There is some level of scrambling there, right, for people that maybe didn't build in a plan for the level of remote work that we're seeing. One provider, Atlas VPN, says VPN use was up 53% in the U.S. last week and more than doubled in the world. Demand for online video and chat tools from Slack to Zoom to WebEx is also increasing. Microsoft's Teams messaging software suffered outages on Monday as lots of people logged on in Europe and the US. The company says it's addressed the issue. While people might have a hard time with some software, Matthew Prince says the internet as a whole can handle the extra load. From the beginning to respond to literally a nuclear emergency. And if you find your video calls are glitchy or slow, experts have a suggestion. Talk more. Audio uses less bandwidth. Shannon Bond, NPR News, San Francisco. This message comes from NPR sponsor, Walden University. Are you looking to create change in your community? A doctoral degree from Walden can help you release your greatness and make a bigger impact on a local, national, or global scene. Become more. Visit waldenview.edu slash DOC. When word came on Monday the latest White House guidance, no gatherings of more than 10 people, that ruled out, among other things, church, synagogue, Friday prayers, and mosques. This week marks the first that many services of all faiths are being canceled or are shifting online. And this at the very moment when so many of us say we are in need of comfort and ritual and spiritual guidance we'll to speak to that. We've invited three guests to join us. In Detroit, Imam Dawood Wali, welcome. Thank you very much. In Denver, we're joined by Episcopal Bishop Dan Edwards, welcome to Bishop Edwards. And in Los Angeles, Rabbi Susan Goldberg, hi there, welcome. Thank you. So I have a first to each of you in turn. Are your houses of worship holding services and, and how are you communicating with your faith communities? Rabbi Goldberg, uh, first. Yes, hi. In California, we have been preparing uh, maybe maybe a, a little bit ahead, you know. Uh, uh, we're now all being told to shelter in place and we saw that coming up last week. So we actually shifted to an online stream for services. Many of the local um, synagogues did that as of last week. And do you actually go to the synagogue and you and you speak as you normally would and it's just getting live stream? Yeah, yeah. It's a very limited amount. Uh, it's just, in some cases, it's just the clergy. I have heard a couple of synagogues where if it's a, a, a family that is celebrating a bar mitzvah, they just have immediate family. Imam, Imam Dawood, let me, let me bring you in here. How are you handling this in Detroit? Well, this is the second Friday in our uh, limited sermon days or on Fridays. This is the second Friday when actually given the sermon uh, via Facebook uh, from my home. Uh, so we haven't had uh, those prayers. And for the last two days, we have not had congregational prayers in our mosque here in southeastern Michigan. So beyond Friday being the day of our religious services, we have five daily prayers. And normally uh, our mosque is open for all five prayers. And now uh, our mosques are currently not open. Mm. Bishop Edwards, how about you? People from my congregation to our cathedral worship service on Sunday, and through the week, our lay caregivers and lay ministers are uh, uh, telephoning the whole membership board and the not all visitors uh, to connect and, and offer a password and, and support. And we have um, online interactive fellowships and education gatherings, and we're sending out stories and forms where the members of the congregation stay. 
and I'm going to also electronically send more sermons and uh, and a pastoral message. Yeah, yeah. And it's early days on Jordan Waters, as I feel like I say every day these days. But is it working? What kind of messages are you hearing back from people uh, in your communities in terms of how worried are they, uh, Bishop, Bishop Edwards? Are still in a little bit of shock, and many are expressing uh, worry for what this family members. Uh, and how about there in Detroit? Uh, there's been a mixture. There are some people who are feeling uh, very anxious and not just simply about uh, getting sick, but the uh, the loss of, of jobs. I know one person, um, myself very well, who just got a pink slip yesterday. Uh, so there's that level of anxious or so people are feeling that their jobs may be in jeopardy. And there's other people uh, in our community who are actually uh, very hopeful and seeing this as an opportunity of actually having more time to meditate and pray and to uh, escape uh, a lot of the, the, the noise of, of their normal days. So hmm. there's mixed reactions in my community. I should, I should let people listening know that you and I have met before. Bishop Edwards, I interviewed you in Las Vegas right after the mass shooting there in 2017. You had just delivered the sermon at Christ Church Episcopal and afterward, we went and sat outside in the courtyard and you told me how you were wrestling with figuring out how to help people find meaning in tragedy. How does this moment compare? Your word. We went and sat outside in the courtyard and you told me how you were wrestling with figuring out how to help people find meaning in tragedy. How does this moment compare? Well, uh, actually this, this moment is um, in a sense larger because it has more direct impact on people's uh, daily lives. Uh, so this is, this is more immediate, mm -hmm. uh, intelligent. Mm -hmm. Rabbi Goldberg, what kind of challenges are you coming from from, from your life? I think it's very simple. Just express that there is a variety of different experiences depending on what's happening in your life. We're hearing very different things from people, people who are alone, having a different experience than those who are home with their kids and at the home school, people who are just beginning chemotherapy or in the middle of that process are having a different experience, healthcare workers, people who have family members who are incarcerated. There's a lot of different experiences inside of it. There is certainly a lot of fear and anxiety and also grief. There's a lot of loss for what um, people were hoping to do or had been planning or wanting to graduate high school. We're hearing a lot of stuff from our teens. And also, I agree with the imam in that there is this opportunity for a committed spiritual practice to really be helping to carry people through this. All of us come from ancient traditions, and certainly all of our people have experienced past plagues, uh, past moments of incredible tragedy. And we do have the resources inside of ancient spiritual traditions to help people make meaning by doing things like being of service to others, by meditating, by praying, by studying. And I'm also really experiencing how much people need to be of service to others and trying to find creative ways as we support people to shelter in place, which we are all doing in California. We are staying in our homes. Indeed. How to be of service to neighbors and community from that vantage point. Wise words. Let me let, in the minute we have left, let the other two come back in. I just wonder if you would send us out on a note. What, what is the name of the next one? Uh, Bishop Edwards. Well, the, what matters isn't how long we live, but how well we live. And a good life comes from an open heart. Fear closes the heart, life opens it. So when we feel afraid, we can do a spiritual keto move to turn that to empathy and offer to pray for someone, help someone uh, to be of service yes. in the world. A uh, 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 parting thought from you, just a brief last word, Imam Talib. Uh, we believe in one God and there's one creation. We're one human family and we are all in this together and we need to band together as human beings to get through this irrespective of nationality, Thank race, you. or religious uh, orientation. Thank you. Thanks to all three of you. Imam Dawood Walid, 
Bishop Dan Edwards and Rabbi Susan Goldberg. Last Friday, there were 1,264 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in the United States. Today, there are more than 15,000 confirmed cases. The rhythms of daily life have come to a screeching halt, like here in California, where I am. There's a recognition of our that requires of this moment that we direct a statewide order for people to stay at home. That is California Governor Gavin Newsom last night ordering residents to stay at home. Despite, despite the drastic measures being in California and around the country over the past week, coronavirus continues to spread. And as predicted, hospitals are becoming overwhelmed. The head of Massachusetts General Hospital is asking for people with 3D printers to print masks to try to alleviate shortages. In, in Indiana, people are sewing homemade masks and dropping them off for healthcare workers. And hospital systems across the country are warning there are not enough ICU beds to take care of the coming wave of critically ill people. We're now going to spend the next several minutes talking through where the U.S. is in its ability to deal with the growing pandemic. And to do that, I'm joined now by three people who have played key roles in federal government. Dr. Margaret Hamburg, who was FDA commissioner under President Obama. Douglas holtz Egan, who was chief economist for President George W. Bush and economics policy advisor for the John McCain campaign in 2008. He joins us via Skype. And Tara O'Toole, who served as undersecretary of science and technology at the Department of Homeland Security. Welcome to all three of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tara, I'm going to start with you. It looks like, you know, the national stockpile, which are supplies held in reserve for emergencies, it looks like at this point the national stockpile isn't big enough to meet the anticipated need. And I, I want to play you something that President Trump said at supposed to be As with testing, the governor is supposed, supposed to be doing it. But then former Homeland Security Secretary Jay Johnson took issue with that. This was from an interview on NPR this morning. The president is actually, in many respects, the shipping clerk in chief here, mm -hmm. and it's up to the president and the Congress to ensure that we have what we need on the front line. Who do you think is right about this? Is the president the shipping clerk? I wouldn't say the president is the shipping clerk, but the federal government certainly plays a key role in ensuring that frontline healthcare workers have the gear that they need in emergencies like this. Strategic National Stockpile was started more than 20 years ago by President Clinton, initially to respond to chemical, biological, and nuclear events, but it's expanded since then to include stuff for hurricanes, for Zika um, outbreaks, and much else. But it was always intended to be a source of supplies that would bridge the um, from the time of the emergency to when the private sector could come back online and use its supply chains. Right. Well, let's talk need. about that, bridging this gap between the public and private sector. I mean, one measure that could potentially be helpful is the Defense Production Act. The president signed it more than two days ago. Uh, this helps the Production Act. Should have been activated much sooner. That's a hard question to answer. We should have been of the response sooner. I think what we have to do now, rather than point fingers, is get the business dealing with this crisis. My top worry is fast turnaround testing in the hospitals. It's taking most hospitals two to three days to get results back, and that is really slowing them down. Right, and we are going to talk more about testing in just a moment, but Douglas holtz Egan, I want to turn to you. You know, this crisis has been compared to 9-11 and the 2008 financial crisis combined. You advise President George Do you agree with that comparison that we're dealing with something on that level, both 9-11 and 2008 financial crisis combined, something of unprecedented magnitude? Uh, this is certainly bigger than uh, either the financial crisis or the economic fallout of 9 11. Uh, there, there's no question about that. And it's a uh, very different character on the 2008 crisis because this isn't a self inflicted uh, wound as the financial crisis was. This is much closer to 9 11 in that uh, there's been an attack on the United States, not terrorism, but a virus. And it's had dramatic consequences for the safety of our citizens. And that's the first response. So the public health response is. The top priority and, and doing that well is analogous to taking on the threat of global terrorism. And then there's a second response, which is can you insulate the economy from the consequences of that to the extent possible 
and how quickly can you get back to normal life? Well, let's and in talk both about cases, that. we knew very little about that. I mean, do you do you think so far, life. if I could just jump in, do you think that so far the federal government is taking the right steps to insulate the economy and keep it going? Uh, I think the short answer is no, this is not my portfolio, but the top economic response is to actually do the public health uh, response right. Uh, more aggressive testing, you know, knowing the epidemiology better uh, allows you to shorten the amount of time that you have to address that. And that, that um, makes it easier to get back to normal. It lowers the economic costs. I, I think it's pretty clear that we haven't done a great job on that so far. We need to do better. Now, you see the Congress debating the very large response that they, they are trying to put together. Right. And, and we'll, we will see. Uh, out of that room with the deal on Sunday and vote on Monday, which is what I expect, what does that look like? And, and there, I think there are some key things that have to be present. We have to keep small and medium businesses open and their employees on the payroll to, to minimize the devastation. That's, that's the key. We don't want to lose the businesses, but we certainly don't want the people to get laid off. They need that paycheck. And the more we do that, the, the easier it will be to recover afterwards. Let me ask you this. Other economists have cautioned that until you contain the spread of the virus, that any sort of economic uh, measures are only are going to amount to a rescue, that it won't lead to a recovery, and that companies are going to continue coming back for more money. Is that a fair assessment, that you first have to contain the spread of the virus before you can get into recovery mode? Uh, I think that is a fair assessment. I, again, I think this is like 9-11, where if you recall, well, Afterwards, there was never the sense that we were we knew we were we were secure. There was deep suspicion about the next attack, and we spent millions and billions of dollars to secure the airlines, to make every office building safe, to inspect every container that came into the United States. And the, the economic toll it took was a very very slow slow growth that people were very unhappy with. There was a lot of discontent at the time. I think if we don't uh, take on uh, the the virus effectively, we're going to be in roughly the same position. Okay, Margaret Hamburg, I want to turn to you. You know, South Korea has fared better than most places during the spread of this virus, uh, in part because they have had widespread testing available. So let me ask you, if we had seen the level of testing here in the U.S. that we saw that we are seeing in South Korea, would we in the U.S. be living in a slightly different world with less social distancing, avoiding lockdowns like the one I'm living under in California right now? What do you think? Well, it's, of course, hard to speculate, but... I think almost certainly we would be much better off. We have lost critical time in understanding the nature and scope of this outbreak here. We've lost critical time in identifying uh, who is in fact infected and needs to be isolated to provide appropriate medical care and treatment to these patients. So I think it, it is really troubling how we, as one of the most advanced nations in the world, if not the premier nation in the world in terms of our ability to harness science and technology, to do a whole range of things, including make really good diagnostics. And we're not. Technology. Last week, when you said, has that happened? Well, we're seeing progress in terms of new diagnostics that are going through what's called the emergency use authorization process at FDA. Um, but we're not in the field. Um, access to testing kits has increased. We're also seeing, unfortunately, shortages of some of the reagents necessary to, to make use of those diagnostics and also the nasal pharyngeal swabs necessary uh, to do some of these tests. So, you know, we are not where we want to be. We're not where we need to be, and we're certainly not where we could be. I think with, unfortunately, okay. better preparedness and, and um, a better um, uh, and more coordinated we'll have to leave it there. That is Dr. Margaret Hamburg, FDA Commissioner under President Obama, Douglas Holtz Egan, who was Chief Economist for President George W. Bush, and Tara O'Toole, who served as under who served as Undersecretary of Science and Technology at the Department of Homeland Security. Thank you to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
This message comes from NPR sponsor, Walden University. At Walden, they see greatness in you, and they have a doctoral degree program that can help you reach your full potential. Turn your passion into power and ignite your career. Learn more about our online doctoral program at waldenview.eu slash doc. Okay, to some NPR news now. Next week, we are launching a new program. It's called the National Conversation with All Things Considered. And my colleague, Ari Shapiro, will be hosting the debut episode this coming Monday. He is here. Ari, welcome to All Things Considered. Hi, Mary Louise. Thank you. Tell us more about the show. Well, our goal is to answer listener questions about the coronavirus. So everything from what to do if you believe you've come in contact with somebody who has COVID-19 to how do you educate your kids who are home from school. So every evening, we're going to have NPR reporters and outside experts addressing people's concerns five nights a week, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 Pacific. And real quick, how can people join us? People can go to the website, npr.org slash national conversation and submit their questions. We'll also be on social media with the hashtag NPR conversation. And they can send us voice memos. All right, that's my co-host and buddy, now also host of the National Conversation with All Things Considered, Ari Shapiro. Thanks, Ari. See you, Mary Louise. With borders closing all over the world to stop the spread of the coronavirus, today's announcement from Secretary of State Mike Pompeo was expected. I also want to announce today uh, that the United States and Mexico have agreed to risk non-essential travel across our shared border. Both our countries know the importance uh, of working together to limit the spread of the virus and ensure that commerce that supports our economy continues to keep flowing. The restrictions take effect at midnight tonight. Many details still being worked out, which we're going to talk through now with NPR's Carrie Tong. She's in Mexico City. Hey, Carrie. Hi. So Secretary Pompeo, we heard there, he says commerce will keep flowing. What does that mean? What's restricted what's not? And remember that commerce is a billion dollars a day across the southern border. <laughs> Truck traffic, cargo, containers, commerce, supplies, all that will keep crossing the border. There will be no interruption. To legal business whatsoever. That was the word from Washington. Also, as go back and forth all along the border, or at least there are first responders who live in northern Mexican border towns and work in the U.S. There's truck drivers, there's grocery store workers. A lot of workers are in the food supply chain. They work in food processing centers, distributors. They all live in Tijuana. There are 30,000 workers who live in Tijuana and cross the to jobs in San Diego Mountain. What will be affected? Our uh, tourists, those going south and north, or recreation offers that same sort of border crossing. Um, what is Mexico saying? Are they on board? Yes, Mexico says that um, they have been in negotiations for the last past couple of days at high levels. And just oh, yeah. Mexico's foreign minister said today that those talks were at times tense because, for Mexico's part, the health of the economy is very important to take care of, as well as containing the virus. He says we cannot paralyze the border economy. He will not allow that to happen. Um, Carrie, what are the implications for border officers, people caught crossing into the U.S. illegally? For health reasons, they will no longer take a migrant caught illegally trying to cross the border to a detention facility. They don't want to risk the spread of uh, spreading the virus. So any Mexican migrants now caught along the border, even asylum seekers, will not be taken to a facility, but processed right there in the field and immediately sent back across the border. Mexico says it will keep taking back Central American asylum seekers, although others will to try to stop the spread of coronavirus and COVID-19. What is the situation in Mexico? Right now in Mexico, we have 164 confirmed cases. And that is suspiciously low compared to the U.S. Look at San Diego alone has 89 confirmed cases. Uh, Baja, California, and the state right across the border has just two. Tijuana, that huge border city across from San Diego, has none. So Mexico clearly has not been doing a lot of testing. And I talked to this businessman who has a medical tourism company in Tijuana, and he, it's incredible, he himself went down to the border because he was just so concerned about there not being enough testing. He set up a tent there, and now he's screaming visitors coming across the border. He says if he gets a suspicious case, he refers them right to the center. He says he's going to come back to the And he just says Mexico is in 
prepare for what's coming. One thing that is the worst thing is that we don't have enough ICU beds uh, in the city. We're extremely short. We don't have ventilators. We don't have treatment areas. Concerns throughout the country is now in Mexico with this unprepared state. Schools were still open. Government offices were still open. Wait, hold on. Schools are still open? That sounds like a, a time capsule from the past. Yes, not, we have not implemented the social distancing uh, practices now, and they won't go in effect officially until money. Many states and municipalities have taken it upon themselves to see the stricter measures, but the federal government is saying social distancing doesn't go in effect until money. Thank you, Period. That's very fun. The first reports of COVID-19 deaths in America came from the Seattle area, and the number of cases has been mounting ever since. Hospitals there are not yet happy, but things are tense and that the COVID was coming. And there is not impossible reports from We're still at the empty tent stage of this in Kirkland, Nurse Barbara Jensen outside the emergency entrance. We have a big diesel heater here so that we can keep the space warm and it can be configured in any way we want. They could fit 30 beds out here, but right now the idea is to use the tent to test suspected coronavirus patients to keep them from contaminating the emergency room, which is still relatively quiet. It almost feels like a con storm, honestly. Jeff Tomlin is Evergreen Health Senior. He and his staff have spent the last few weeks watching the news of the hospitals in Italy while getting ready for whatever's coming here. We don't know where this is going. We're praying that the uh, social distancing and all those things are going to keep those numbers down. Uh, for Some shipments from the feds, medical staff around Seattle active gear like masks and gowns by reusing them or wearing them, putting their own health at risk. Evergreen Health, for instance, has had a number of confirm how many or whether it happens to work. One doctor in his 40s is known to be in critical condition. While keeping enough staff. Another pinch point here may be the supply of ventilators, machines to help critical COVID-19 patients breathe. Mary Shepler is Evergreen's chief nursing officer. We've really looked at our ventilator capacity over the last 10 days and have started to look at where we can rent. Yes, rent. Renting gear is something that hospitals often do during bad flu seasons, but there are only so many rentals available, so Evergreen is also looking elsewhere. Say the shuttered long-term care facility where it found 16 ventilators or even the mobile units used for transport. They think they can double their capacity, but Scheffler says that will also mean finding enough of the right staff. So we've been looking at which of our RNs for respiratory therapists before. Ventilator management. Ventilator manufacturers have time some doctors are not measures. I just need to show you one This is an emergency room position. In Charlie Urban Baptist crisis, in this demo, would be an extreme measure. If it was me, I had four patients, I needed intubation, and I only had one ventilator, I could pick one with a quick and try to help one of This is clearly off the label and likely would only be used in dire circumstances, which we may see. Hospitals in Seattle hope that they prepare enough to avoid such dramatic steps. The county is adding more sites to treat less serious cases away from the hospitals, and the emergency response network here has set up a system to where they're needed most. Even ventilators could be shared. Francis Rito is an infectious disease doctor at Everly. My hope is that in four to eight weeks, people will look at this and wonder why we did all this, because they will view it as having been completely unnecessary. I don't think that's going to be finished. Martin Costi, NPR News. Republican Senator Richard Burr of North Carolina called to conduct a complete review of his own actions. This follows reports that Senator Burr sold up to $1.7 million worth of stocks just before the recent domestic picture. He painted a much dire, a much more dire picture comparing it to the 1918 flu pandemic. And here it's clear that the following story of the recent discussions about the election they learned while serving in Congress. Thank you. All right, so just remind us how this all started with a piece of tape that you found. That's right. This all started when NPR obtained and published a secret tape of Senator Burr warning a private group of well connected constituents how bad coronavirus would be. 
he made his point a few weeks ago and, and while he warned attendees at this private luncheon about his concerns on February 27th, he never told the broader public. The news organization ProPublica saw my story 